Dr. James Crisp is Professor Emeritus of History at North Carolina State University. He has authored or co-authored numerous publications related to Texas history, and his work has received state, national, and international awards for excellence. His award-winning Sleuthing the Alamo, Davy Crockett's Last Stand, and Other Mysteries of the Texas Revolution has been translated into Spanish and published in Mexico. Dr. Chris's most recent work is Inside the Texas Revolution, the enigmatic memoir of Herman Ehrenberg, which won the 2021 Somerville, Summerfield G. Roberts Award from the Sons of the Republic of Texas. Please welcome Dr. Crisp. I was actually in San Antonio last month because the book won another award. It won an award for being the best reference work in Western history, and I figured they gave me the prize for the best reference work because it's too damn long to read. <laughs> uh, it is a long, long book. It, it's, it is essentially uh, Herman Ehrenberg's memoir of the Texas Revolution, 34 chapters, and I wrote an introduction to every, every chapter. Uh, and I, ha I worked on the book off and on for 29 years and had a blast. If you're having fun, it's not work. This is where I first ran into Herman Ehrenberg, within a few blocks of this building, in the old library tower at the University of Texas in 1971 when I was doing dissertation research. And there's a master's thesis over there, and I was reading the typescript. This is the first full translation in the English. Didn't happen until 1925. Edgar William Bartholomew. Um, my dissertation and most of my research since then has been on the relationship between Anglos and Hispanics in Mexican and independent Texas. And that's what I was working on then. Ehrenberg saw his first Mexicans in Nacogdoches. Um, when he had joined the New Orleans Grays and come to Texas to, as a volunteer in the Revolution. Um, he had been in the United States only since 1834, and he was still a teenager when he fought in the Texas Revolution. What I remember most, and certainly remembered for years most about his memoir, was chapter four. It's called Das Coffee House. Um, Adolphus Stern, the Nacogdoches resident, takes these New Orleans Grays into a Mexican coffee house at midnight. And what makes me remember chapter four most is that there is cursing, smoking, drinking, gambling, and dirty dancing. Seriously. <clears throat> That's what stayed in my mind, especially that fourth chapter. And so I finished the dissertation and I was working on the basic idea of Anglo-Mexican relations, but I kind of forgot about Ehrenberg. I forgot about Ehrenberg for the most part until 1992, when I was a guest at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I, was my, I had a great title. I was humanist in residence. How does that sound? God, humanist in resonance. I'm not sure what it means, but it was a great title. Anyway, I, I didn't have to teach. I just worked on whatever I wanted to work on. And what I wanted to work on was this Anglo-Mexican relationship. And my hypothesis, my thesis, as I worked against traditional Texas history, was that the Texas Revolution was not caused primarily by racial and ethnic division. That's just not true as far as I'm concerned. It was caused by political and economic differences between Mexico and Texas. And that, when I say Texas, I'm talking about the Tejanos too. The men like Navarro and Ruiz and Seguin and the others who fought with the rebels in Texas. But this wonderful new book, prize-winning book by a great historian, Paul Lack, had just come out and he really threw me on my ear. Because three times in this book, as he argues that the Texas Revolution had become a race war by the beginning of 1836, a war between the races, is a speech that he quoted from Sam Houston. 
It's a speech in which Houston tells the Texans, the Texan army down near Refugio and Goliad, don't attack Matamoros, don't cross the Rio Grande, you can't trust the Mexicans. The Mexicans and Texans can never live together in the same area. He said, the, the phlegm from the south and the hardworking people from the north will never get along. Neither can Indians and whites, and the Mexicans are half Indians anyway. Now, how many of you would have known at that moment that there was something seriously wrong with this alleged speech? I beg your pardon? I'm sorry, you're, you're going to have to speak a lot louder. Okay, anyway, Sam Houston would never have said that Indians and whites could not live together. Sam Houston was a naturalized Cherokee Indian. His second wife was Cherokee. He spoke fluent Cherokee. All his life he defended Indian intelligence, Indian rights, Indian land holdings, and he was, as far as the Tejanos were concerned, friends and allies of Tejanos in Texas. But here was this speech by a good historian. So what's the first question I ask? Where do you get the speech? You recognize this? John Jenkins, Papers of the Texas Revolution, 1970s. There's the speech in the Papers of the Texas Revolution with all the racist language in there. Where'd Jenkins get it? The writings of Sam Houston, edited here at the University of Texas by Amelia Williams and her professor, mentor, Eugene Barker, the, the sort of guru of Texas history for the first half of the 20th century. What's my next question? Where did they get it? You see that? That's Bartholomew. That's the thesis. His thesis was the translation of Ehrenberg. The speech was written in German, in Germany, in 1842, by Hermann Ehrenberg, and published the next year in Leipzig, in 1843. Well, in the meantime, as I'm rediscovering this, it's not easy to go pick up a master's thesis and read it. It's a lot easier to buy a book or to check out a book from the library. And many of you may have seen this book with Milam and Fannin, Adventures of a German Boy in the Texas Revolution. I've cut off the bottom of this book, the bottom of the title page, because it gets very complicated. I got this book, read it, guess what was missing? No, well, yes, the speech was missing, but what did I notice even earlier? Chapter four was gone. No dirty dancing, no gambling, no smoking. And chapter one was gone, where he gives the background of Mexican history, which is very heavy in its anti-Catholicism and its, and its anger towards Mexico. <sighs> I compared this book, this translation, with the Bartholomew translation, with the original German, spent the entire Christmas holidays of 1992-93 comparing them all. Whole chapters, paragraphs, sentences are gone. Many without any ellipses. I did it. And I didn't quite know what to make of it. Now, here's where it gets complicated. This is J. Frank Doby's personal copy. It's here on the University of Campus at the Harry Ransom Center in the Doby Collection. Doby reviewed the book for the Dallas Morning News. And he wrote on his copy, the prefacer, Herbert Gambrell, and the reader himself, J. Frank Doby. But let's look at these other people. Henry Smith, Charlotte Churchill, Jerry Bywaters. Now I knew who Jerry Bywaters was. There's a 
image of his oil field girls in my hotel room next door. Uh, became a famous artist. He did these drawings for the Ehrenberg book. But Bywaters was dead, and Gambrel was dead, and Dobie was dead, and nobody, no resource could tell me who Charlotte Churchill or Henry Smith were. But fortunately, I called Ron Tyler, who's my guru in all things. I said, Ron, help me figure this out. And he said, well, you know, Francine Carraro is working on a book on Jerry Bywaters and interviewed him before he died. So I called Francine and said, look, I've got a theory that this book was written for children, although it's never advertised as such. She said, well, I'm not sure about that. He never mentioned it. I said, well, before I hang up, who could this Henry Smith be? Oh, well, that would be his best friend, Henry Nash Smith. Does the name Henry Nash Smith mean anything to anybody out there? Virgin Land, the American West as symbol and myth, 1950. He was a founder of the American Studies Movement. He wrote the first, he, he received the first PhD in American Civilization from Harvard. He became the editor of the Mark Twain papers at the Bancroft Library in Berkeley. He was the man. And he had hidden his editorship of this book. I eventually interviewed twice John Chapman, who was one of his best friends. And essentially Chapman thought he had been very poorly treated because what happened is he was listed as the editor, but the man who did the cuts was William Tardy, the publisher of the book, a high school Spanish teacher who wanted the book to be adopted by the Texas public schools during the centennial of the Texas Revolution. The book was published in the fall of 1935. Henry and Eleanor had their first date at Christmas or so. They got married in April. And in 50 years of marriage, he never mentioned his first book to his wife. That's rare among professors, wouldn't you think? Now, this is the second edition of the book. It's one that John Jenkins brought out in the 1960s. Can you read the names on the bottom? It's Gambrel the prefacer and Bywaters the illustrator. Why do you think John Jenkins didn't put Henry Smith or Charlotte Churchill on the cover? He didn't know who they were. The people at Berkeley didn't know that Smith had done this book. Smith had walked away from this book because he didn't want to embarrass the people from SMU who had helped write it, and he didn't want his name to be associated with it. It was a ticking time bomb in his resume because it was drastically censored and distorted. So who's the other person besides Smith we didn't know? Charlotte Churchill. There you see her with her St. Exupery cousins. Oh, wow, no kidding. See the little kid on the right and on the first row? His name was Antoine, as in the French war hero, as in the man who wrote Le Petit Prince, the little prince, and who died in the Mediterranean in 1944 when his plane went down. This was on the, franc, the 50 franc note before the euro was adopted. He's, his book has been translated into more languages than any other book in French. And Charlotte was his first cousin. She was here in Texas teaching in Our Lady of the Lake and f realized that no one had ever translated Herman Ehrenberg's book in terms of publication. So she wrote it, translated it in the English, sent it to the Southwest Review. They published an excerpt from it in Dallas and then gave it to the Tardy Publishing Company to publish as a book. This book has had a checkered past. This memoir has had a checkered past. Um, this book came out, I think, in the 90s. Natalie Ornish, a nice lady, no longer with us, had written a book in the 80s called Pioneer Jewish Texans. 
And she, like Rabbi Cohen of the Galveston Synagogue, believed that Ehrenberg was Jewish. Um, in her book, Pioneer Jewish Texans, she lists, lists all the things that persuaded her that he was Jewish, and none of them are provable. It's all hearsay. And Natalie was not a historian, and this book is a kind of embarrassment. Um, I probably shouldn't say anything more about it, but she has two pictures of Ehrenberg in the book. One's a black guy, one's a white guy. Uh, you know, the, the black guy is a buffalo soldier whose insignias have been erased by Jose Cisneros in order to publish it in the Ehrenberg book. It's really weird. Uh, this is another part of the checkered past. The Mockingbird Books and Bernie published the thesis with a couple of corrections before my translation came out. Not my translation, Jim Kearney and Lewis Brister's translation. Kearney is with me today. Jim, are you out there? Wave at the people. <laughs> I worked on this book so long that my translator died. And I had to turn to Jim Kearney, who had turned out to be a really, really good translator, as well as a very good friend. This is what the original looks like. Texas and her revolution. And you can see the quotation from Schiller's play about William Tell. William Tell was a hero of the Swiss fight against the Austrians and the independence of the Swiss, Swiss Confederation. Um, Texas and her revolution. And then the fight for freedom. This is the second edition. And then Adventures of a German, Travels and Adventures of a German in Texas. There's a German scholar named Ute Ritzenhofen who believes that this title got more and more anodyne as the Prussian and other censorship got more and more severe in Germany in what's known as the Fuhrmärz, the years before the March revolutions of 1848 when censorship was coming down really hard. Why do you think Ehrenberg would have been censored? It wasn't dirty dancing. He was basically in favor of freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and democracy. And that could get you into serious trouble in Central Europe at that time, and almost anywhere in Europe at the time. But his book went in three editions in three years and became the most heavily bought book on Texas in Germany in the 1840s. Now, what I've done in every chapter is list the German title, an English translation, and then my title. Sometimes my titles are um, a little bit um, what's the best way to say it? Uh, tongue in cheek perhaps. But this is serious. Uh, the Black Legend is the story of the evil Spanish colon colon colonial uh, rule. The missing blacks are the African American slaves in Anglo Texas that he doesn't talk about at all. And he does talk seriously about the reality of Indian power in Texas because um, they were in charge of most of what we today call Texas. Um, what Ehrenberg tells us and what he doesn't. This is Banks Arcade in New Orleans where Ehrenberg signed up to fight the Texas Revolution. What he didn't understand was the tension going on in New Orleans between the uh, English-speaking and French-speaking people of New Orleans, but even more serious, the, the Mexican Federalists who had come in. They wanted American help to revolutionize Mexico and make it back into a federal republic against the Centralists under Santa Ana. What the Anglos in New Orleans wanted, as someone mentioned earlier today, was to get their hands on Texas, to make it independent and probably part of the United States. And this was a, there, there was a great deal of tension. Ehrenberg knew nothing about it at the time that he signed up. This is Adolphus Stern, the man who baptized Sam Houston as a Catholic so he could become a, a Mexican citizen. Um, Ehrenberg makes Adolphus Stern into an anti-Catholic like himself. 
Adolphus Stern was married to a devout Catholic woman and fortunately kept a diary. And I was able to prove that Adolphus Stern was anything but anti-Catholic, not at all. Now, here we are at chapter four. Another name for Walpurgisnacht is Hexennacht. Hexennacht happens in the fall, in the, fall, in, in the uh, spring in Germany. It's when the witches go up on Mount Brocken in the Hartz Mountains and party with whom? That would be the devil, yes, Mephistopheles. <laughs> um, and so the description in this chapter of a Mexican Fandango is very much like a German description of Walpurgisnacht. Um, now, in this, Ron, is this a lithograph? I'm not sure, but in this drawing, a little after the Texas Revolution of a Mexican Fandango, you can, you can see the sort of wild dancing, but way back in the back, there's a violinist. Do you see the fiddle player far in the back? Well, Ehrenberg calls him capital O-L-E, capital B-U-L-L. -L. And my first translator translated that as old bull. The violinist is an old bull. No. Ole Bull, Norwegian virtuoso, who played in Leipzig with Felix Mendelssohn and the Gewandhaus Orchestra in the 1840s. Uh, Ehrenberg knew a lot, and he knew who this Ole Bull was, and he's facetiously calling the Mexican violinist Ole Bull. What about Meister Petz? When they had their big banquet in Nacogdoches, in honor of the New Orleans Grays. There was a bear roasted uh, as the centerpiece of the table. And around the bear was his original skin and fur. And in his mouth was this flag, the Mexican flag for the Constitution of 1824. But translator after translator had trouble with Meister Petz. They weren't sure what to do with it. But if you go back into German popular literature, you find that that's Br'er Bear. You don't call him a bear any more than the French would use the word for bear. They use Bruin because a bear is a kind of totemic figure. If there's a taboo about using the term bear. And so this is Meister Petz. In German children's literature, there's Meister Petz, who's a bear, Meister Longor, who's a donkey, Meister Longbein, who's a Stork, he's a stock character in German children's literature. And that's where Meister Petz comes from. This is the flag that was given to the New Orleans Grays in San Augustine as they came across into Mexican Texas. And then as he marches across Texas with the New Orleans Grays, he talks a lot about the Comanches. I don't think he knew much at all about the Comanches when he marched across Texas but he lived in Texas for four years after the revolution and he served as a ranger on the Texas frontier in 1840 and came very close to being in the Battle of Plum Creek, although he was discharged just a few weeks before the battle. Um, so he says a lot about the Comanches, most of it true in this chapter. There's a prairie fire. He believes that Indians said it. What's interesting in this chapter and the next chapter on the camp of the militia outside of San Antonio is what he has to say about the Americans. The Americans who he finds amazing. This is a later picture. Of course, they weren't taking pictures in San Antonio in 1835. But the, the Americans were totally casual. When they call the roll, they might walk up, they might not, they might answer from their tent, they'd go back to cooking their meals. Um, he thought it was strangely democratic. Well, this strangely democratic army goes after the Mexicans in San Antonio, goes after the Mexican army, the centralists. And he has a eyewitness, very accurate, story of how that battle went and how they eventually won. He didn't know how close they came to losing it, 
But the Mexicans ran out of ammunition first. Then he's in San Antonio for a few weeks. And I called it the land of the frenemies because you never knew who was your friend and who was your enemy, and some of them could be both. So he takes a trip out to the Mission San Jose. And as they're looking around, they find a cache of corn, bushels and bushels and bushels of corn down in the basement of the convent. And he goes back and reports it to the Texan authorities. And there's a long scene where the Texans eventually get some of that corn for their men who are now going into the, eventually into the Alamo. Ehrenberg was one of those men who was convinced that they needed to go on the offensive. They didn't really care that much, but they didn't want to just sit around. And so he calls it the departure for Matamoros. And this is where the Houston speech comes in, where Houston goes down to where they're meeting in Refugio, where the army is in Refugio, and says, guys, don't go to Matamoros. It's a big mistake. They'll be ready for you. It's 150 miles without a lot of food and water. You're, you shouldn't do it. And even your friends will become your enemies when you attack their city. Uh, and this is where the speech comes in with the racist language that's not at Houston's, it's Ehrenberg's. Five friends go to the beach and vote for independence. I, f I discovered that Ehrenberg and the friends who were sent to meet Fannin on the coast were all Germans. They go down, wait for him at Copano, and finally Fannin comes in. And they send a rider back to Refugio, and it's the day the election is supposed to take place to elect delegates to the convention that may or may not declare Texas independence. And so at the last minute on the beach, there's a vote. And Ehrenberg and his other friends, besides the one they sent back, are the last ones to, to vote in that list from Refugio. In Ehrenberg's book, when Houston gives his speech, there's an artillery captain by the name of I'm going to almost forget. Thomas K. Pearson. It took me years to figure out who Thomas K. Pearson was. He argued against Houston and lost. Most of the men stayed in Goliad and didn't go to Matamoros. He argued that the army ought to be able to vote in the Refugio elections, and, or the San Patricio elections, and he won, but then the convention threw them out. And he also, when the Mexican army attacked, argued that they shouldn't surrender and then when his men started to surrender anyway, he went out with them and was killed. And so the reason I put this Henley poem in there is because it pretty well sums up the character of Thomas K. Pearson, a guy I disagree with a lot, but you have to respect his attitude. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the, the scroll, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Um, he didn't listen to good advice from anybody. Um, Texans are, are declaring their independence, but it, they're not sure what's going on in Goliad. They're surrounded virtually by the Mexicans. They finally hear about it. They hear about the fall of the Alamo. And it's interesting, he says that when the Mexicans came over the wall, there were seven Texans left. And they were not allowed to surrender, but they were killed. That's the story that became how Davy Crockett died. It was circulating in Texas in various forms. I finally found in the Telegraph and Texas Register in 1843 a story about San Jacinto. And the Mexican general who died there, Manuel Castrillon, and in the story, it says, by the way, Manuel Castrillon, the brave general who died at San Jacinto, was the man who tried to save Davy Crockett's life at the Alamo. That story, in other words, was circulating Crockett's execution. That story was circulating in Texas during the Texas Republic. And I don't think anyone had ever noticed that in the Texas newspaper. 
Galeto is a disaster. Fannin took too long to try to retreat from Goliad. He didn't follow the advice of his men or his officers. He didn't make it to the woods at the, at, uh, around the creek where they could have had the protection and probably won or held off the army. They were captured in the middle of nowhere on a plain, some call, sometimes called the Battle of the Prairie. They had to surrender. They were taken back here. This is the only part of the Goliad Presidio that's original. It's the chapel. They took about 400 men and crammed them in there so closely that they couldn't lie down. They had to sit back to back. They had no food the first day. They had raw meat at the end of the second day, literally raw meat. Um, eventually they were let out into the yard, but of course they were murdered, um, executed on orders directly from Santa Ana on Palm Sunday of 1836. A young man who had read part of Ehrenberg's book that had been translated, a few pages of it on the battle and the executions, had been translated in England and then reprinted in the United States. And a young newspaper editor in Brooklyn uh, read about it. His name was Walter Whitman. And a few years later, when he published The Song of Myself in the book that became Leaves of Grass, he talks about the battle and the executions. And with poetic license, says, not a single one was over 30 years of age. But Whitman was very moved by this. And it made it into his magnum opus. This is the lithograph that Ron Tyler was talking about earlier. It's the, it's the lithograph taken from the drawing that John Chadwick sent to his parents in New Hampshire before he and Fannin and the others were executed. Um, the original drawing I just found out today is now owned by a very wealthy collector in Dallas. Um, yes? The lithograph or the drawing? No, I was asking you about the drawing and where the drawing is now. Oh, so we don't know about the drawing itself. The drawing has been published, and if you buy my book, you'll find a picture of the drawing as well as the lithograph. But no, I asked Ron today, and I think... Um, uh, yeah, he's the lithograph guy. But um, the drawing was hard to get a hold of. A, a man named uh, Stripling... Uh, renovated, rebuilt the Goliad Presidio. He was a restoration architect. And he, in, uh, he had access to the lithograph and eventually they found the drawing. And the drawing uh, was published in the, in the book about Stripling's work on, on restoration. Now here's an interesting title, The Flight Through, through the Wilderness, uh, which I called All Alone on the Crowded Prairie. Um, he was all alone. Most of the Texans who escaped from the Goliad massacre, there were 28 of them in all, counting him, traveled together in groups of two or four or three. He was all alone. Um, and it was crowded because first he began to run into the turkeys that he couldn't shoot and the horses that he couldn't catch. Uh, he had no tinderbox. He couldn't make a fire. And he was getting hungrier and hungrier and weaker and weaker. Um, John C. Duvall, who became the Texan writer, was also at Goliad, also escaped, but he had a tinderbox. And they were able to make a fire, and, and he was also traveling with other people. But John C. Duvall, who was pretty famous in Texas, and Herman Ehrenberg are the people who had the most similar experiences at Goliad and the aftermath. Herman finds the Mexican army and vice versa. Herman tells a story about how he was recaptured by the Mexicans. He says he wasn't recaptured. He says he just walked right into Urea's camp and gave himself up and had a long interview with Urea, General Urea of the Mexican army, advocating for the Texan side. I don't believe a word of it. Uh, what I found in the De La Pena papers when they were at UT San Antonio was the itinario 
of the San Luis Potosi Battalion, they found Ehrenberg. They found him on the banks of the Colorado River when they were waiting for the river to go down. They had to wait almost a week. They found him in the house of some colonists. He gave them a story, which he put in his, autobiography, in his memoir, that he told them he had been left, that he was traveling towards Mexico, got malaria, told the colonists uh, that he couldn't escape with them. He was too weak. They left him back in the, in, the, uh, in the house all alone. And then he says he walks into the Mexican army camp and says, what's going on? Is there a war on or what? Um, that's the story that the San Luis Potosi Battalion gives, that he was left in that house. It's almost certain that he found that house like the other Texans did as they were escaping. They would go into these houses that had been abandoned these, by the runaway scrape and find the food and supplies and things like that that had been left behind. So I call this chapter on Urea's camp, Truth or Dare? Does Ehrenberg dare to tell us the truth about how he really was taken the second time by the Mexican army? I don't think he's telling the truth at all. Um, Scherpf, this is a map, speaking of maps today, that was published by Anton Scherpf in Germany. It's taken from the Hunt and Randall map, a much larger one. A few German words put on it, but this is a book that Ehrenberg had access to in Germany when he was writing his memoir. It's got the speeches, it's got the map, he was able to refer to it, and um, he quotes Scherpf directly on some of the things he says about the Texas Revolution. Uh, Ehrenberg was very much a Houston man. Uh, at the Colorado is about Houston's decision not to fight at the Colorado River, but to keep retreating back to the Brazos and then up to Grosses and eventually down to where he crosses the Buffalo Bayou. But it's at the Colorado where he makes the critical decision not to try, try to fight the Mexicans at that place on the Colorado, on the Colorado River. Here's a really weird chapter. It's called The Amnesty, When Truth is Stranger Than Fiction. There was a doctor in Texas whose name was Dr. Benjamin Harrison. He was the son of William Henry Harrison. Now this is 1836. When did William Henry Harrison run successfully for president? 1840. And he ran on the log cabin and hard cider campaign. That he was just a good old boy who sat out and drank hard cider after his, in, his law, in the front of his log cabin. He was actually an aristocrat from an old Virginia family living in Ohio. But what Ehrenberg does is put log cabins and hard cider all over this chapter. Impossible. It's an anachronism. He's making it up. Harrison was captured by the Mexicans. And although there were rumors he had been killed, he's given an amnesty proclamation from General Urea and sent to talk to the Texan colonists and offering, offering them amnesty if they won't fight against Mexico. It's a very strange chapter, but there's a big germ of truth in it. After Ehrenberg's captured the second time, he's taken to Matagorda. Uh, and you can follow Ehrenberg by following the Mexican army, as I did. He has a whole chapter on Matagorda. He loves the place. He thinks it's absolutely gorgeous. He's entranced by the wildlife, the birds, the fish, the crocodiles. Um, and then they hear about San Jacinto. When the Mexican army hears about San Jacinto, it's that Santa Ana is dead. That was the first word that came from the Battle of San Jacinto. And as one Mexican soldier wrote to another one, one officer said, I don't know what the hell we're going to do now. The army is God knows where. We're in big trouble. And so he talks about the Battle of San Jacinto, doesn't really understand where the Mexicans retreated. He thinks the infantry went to Vince's Bridge when that was just the cavalry. The infantry went backwards to Peggy's Lake. And that's where most of them died. But when the word is clear about San Jacinto, 
a Mexican officer who was born in Prussia, a man named Holtzinger, Juan Jose Holtzinger, takes Ehrenberg and other prisoners and the cannon which is under his jurisdiction and puts them on a couple of barges and they start moving down the Matagorda Bay hoping to get to Matamoros. They want to get to Matamoros in a matter of weeks. It would have taken them years at their pace. They're barely moving. Um, and this retreat I've called the imaginary Texans. Why? Ehrenberg invents an imaginary Texan by the name of John Adams. He doesn't exist. His New York battalion doesn't exist. But Ehrenberg uses him as an example of why Americans are superior to Mexicans. They're Johnny on the spot. They're jacks of all trades. They can take over any situation. And he talks about a storm coming up that almost threatens to sink these barges. The Mexican colonel, the Mexican soldiers don't know what to do, and John Adams takes over and saves them and gets them back to land. It's all baloney. I mean, think about it. Are you going to try to, es to escape, as Ehrenberg says the, the Americans were doing, by getting on a barge filled with sleeping Mexican soldiers and leaving? It makes absolutely no sense. The other reason I call it the imaginary Texans is because Augustine Alcetica, who was the commandant at Matagorda for the Mexicans, knows the army's been defeated at San Jacinto, knows that most of the army is retreating, but he never gets his orders to retreat, and it's driving him crazy. And he finally leaves without orders, and by the time he gets to Case's Crossing of the Colorado, he has, as the Mexican officers say, lost his senses. He admits that he's lost his senses. He gets a mental health discharge, which takes him down to get treatment further south. He says that he was so out of his mind that he tried to fight a bull and had to be stopped by his friends. Um, he invents 600 Texans as his excuse for leaving Matagorda. He said, I was about to be attacked by a, by a group of 600 Texans. They don't exist any more than John Adams exists. So both Ehrenberg and the Mexican commandant are inventing imaginary Texans. Um, when Ehrenberg finally, after his second escape, reaches a house uh, where there are other escaped Texans, the owner of the house shows up and he tells them what's happened. He tells them about the Battle of San Jacinto and what actually happened there and what's going on with the Mexican army. And it's essentially the story of the death march of the Mexican army. Um, they find bodies of Mexicans on the east side of the Colorado River who didn't have a way to cross and who just died there uh, on, the, on the banks of the river. Um, it's, a, it's a tale that is very gruesome, but they toast the victory with glasses of milk. Um, Ehrenberg, after his escape, goes back to Matagorda, Matagorda and says, Colonel Holtzinger, the Prussian, the Rhine Prussian who is in the Mexican army, is probably somewhere on Lavaca Bay by now. So they go out there and they capture him. This picture was discovered this year. Um, it was owned by a German who sold it to a collector in Paris he, the, the statement that came with the picture said that this man was at San Jacinto. Didn't sound exactly right, but he took the back of the frame off and it says across the back of the photograph, Holtzinger. So this is almost certainly Juan Jose Holtzinger. There's a ghost of a chance it might be his son, but I think it's the real guy. Uh, and um, that's the best evidence we have now of who this is. Um, Santa Ana has been captured. He's being held in Velasco and taken over to Quintana. Um, they, the Texan army doesn't let him be sent back to Mexico. Uh, we know that President Burnett and Santa Ana and Ehrenberg were all at the and were all at the same and Holtzinger, as a captive, were all in the same area at the same time. It's not clear that what Ehrenberg says here about them all meeting in the same room is really true. Um, this was one of the most interesting chapters for me. 
I had never heard before I read Ehrenberg about Santa Ana's escape attempt. I just missed that somehow. But there was uh, a botched escape attempt planned by a Catalonian bartender and Ramon Martinez Caro, Santa Ana's personal secretary. Uh, the, the document on the left is the secret uh, letter of transit given by the Mexican consul in New Orleans uh, to Bartolomé Páez uh, to get him into Texas without being captured by Mexican ships. Uh, Caro eventually got cold feet, turned this plot in, was rewarded by give, being given his freedom. Páez was uh, incarcerated, then escaped, and the first wanted poster published in the Republic of Texas was about him. Recaptured, eventually given his freedom. And at the conclusion of Ehrenberg's book, he is a very, very proud citizen of the Texas Republic. Um, this flag had been adopted by the time he left at the end of 1840. He had tried to be a merchant going back and forth between New Orleans and Texas. He had served as a Texas Ranger with um, a lot of out-of-work actors from the Houston theaters. Um, they were told by Hugh McLeod, who was Adjutant General, that they were essentially worthless uh, and had never accomplished anything on the frontier. What they did was guard surveyors who were laying out, which county do you think they were laying out? That would be Travis. Uh, they were laying out the boundaries between Travis and the nearby counties. Um, and then this, and I won't belabor this, is what Ehrenberg did. I only found out in the final copy editing stage when he actually came back to North America. It had to do with a misdated document here at the Briscoe Center in the Ashville Smith papers. But we thought he came back in 44. It was actually the summer of 43. And by 1844, he took the Oregon Trail to the Pacific and then spent the next 22 years in the Pacific, the American West, the California Gold Rush, the Mexican War, the Civil War, the Apache Raids. He had a very full life before he was shot to death in 1866 on the porch of a stagecoach station in Dos Palmas, California. This photograph of Ehrenberg was discovered in 2016 in a thrift shop in Manhattan where it sold to a collector for $30. He wasn't sure who it was until he got it home. He couldn't read the business card on the back because it was so faded until he got it home and put it under a magnifying glass. All it says on the business card, other than what's written by hand, is Herman Ehrenberg, Arizona. And as I told someone today, if you had sent a letter from New York City where that picture was taken, to Herman Ehrenberg, Arizona, he would get the letter for two reasons. One, there weren't very many people in Arizona. And two, he was one of the most famous people in Arizona. He was a founding father of Arizona. The picture was given to a German immigrant, uh, Dr. Rittler, um, probably a member of his family, just didn't know what it was and turned it into the thrift shop. Uh, it's now owned at San Marcos by the Whitliff Collections. Uh, and that's Herman. That's his story. Thank you for listening. If you've got a couple of questions for Dr. Crisp, we're, we're ready. <clears throat> there was one. No. Mine is just in your book. Um, you're speaking to us right now. So in your book, there's the translation. Are your footnotes and all your side notes right? Like They come as end notes to each chapter. End notes, okay. Yeah. Because you said your book was uh, big. <laughs> yeah, 650 something pages. Yeah. Uh, by the time he's got his memoir and my introduction to the book and to each chapter, and then a 50 or 60 page summary of the last part of his life, the epilogue. Um, it's a long book. Um, there was my knowledge of the Texas Revolution, about which I'm supposed to be an expert was doubled by doing this book. He's got so much stuff in there. This is, a, is an everyman. As a citizen of the Texas Republic and a T 
teenage volunteer in the Texas Army. He's telling you what everyone in Texas thought they knew. Half the time it's not accurate, but it's helpful to know what he thought and what they thought was the truth. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment. Uh, having worked with Dr. Crisp on the translation, it was a wonderful experience because uh, I've never in my life met such an, a perfectionist. <laughs> and as I look back over our emails, sometimes we spent 10, we exchanged 10 emails on the meaning of one word or something, a phrase, uh, back and forth, just to get it absolutely and right. He's good. He's it was really a wonderful good. experience. It's, it's an amazing um, book. There is one endnote, speaking of endnotes, that has a prize offered. There's a word that we had a bit of difficulty with called Pickling's Army. It's been translated as Drunken Army, Pickled Army, Smoke Tearing Army. We're not quite sure, but we think it's Smoke Tearing because of clues elsewhere in the book about the smoky skins of the Mexicans that Ehrenberg mentions. But at the bottom of the footnote, we offer a prize to anyone who can give us a better translation. And the prize is limited to a beer and a smoke tearing. <laughs> Are there any others? Well, if not, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>